Welcome to Resolutions, the official podcast of the American Bar Association section of Dispute Resolution. Every episode is a journey into the heart of conflict resolution, guided by our diverse community of experts. We're here to explore innovative strategies, share wisdom from the field, and inspire excellence in resolving disputes. Whether you're a dispute resolution professional, a curious learner, or someone passionate about fostering understanding and peace, you're in the right place. Let's dive into today's conversation and discover how we can transform conflict into opportunity together. I'm your host, Darren Gotthelf. This week, I'm sitting with Tennessee State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, Teresa Teeple to discuss a day in the life of a state long-term care ombudsman. Teresa has been the Tennessee State Long-Term Care Ombudsman since 2022. In this role, she leads a team of 19 district ombudsman staff who address issues and complaints for residents of roughly 700 long-term care facilities, accounting for around 60,000 beds in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and group homes. Prior to assuming her current role in Tennessee, Teresa oversaw the Ohio Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Advocacy Efforts for people duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. She holds a Master's of Social Work and a Master's of Public Administration degree from SUNY Binghamton and a Bachelor's degree in Sociology from the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Welcome, Teresa. Before we jump in, uh, I know you're a member of the ABA's Planning Committee uh, for Ombudsman Day 2024. Um, can we just, can you tell us a little bit about that before we get started? Yeah, yep, I sure am involved this year, which has been a lot of fun. I represent the National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs, or NASOP for short, on the Ombuds Day subcommittee. And Ombuds Day, for folks that don't know, this year it's held on October 10th, really is in recognition of a profession that many don't know has existed for Um, centuries, multiple centuries, but remains relatively unknown, and that is the ombuds profession. Some people call us ombuds or ombudsmen or ombuds persons. Our theme this year is ombuds here to hear you, and we believe that really spans across multiple ombuds entities, governmental organizations, and then those of us that really work to serve vulnerable populations. And Really, in all of those ombuds roles, we work to first listen. So active listening is critical, regardless of the type of ombuds that you are. And by actively listening, we can help individuals resolve their problems and escalate concerns if we need to. Yeah, we'll we'll be hosting a really exciting webinar. I can't give you details on that yet. Stay tuned, but I'm actually very much looking forward to that. Um, And we're also continuing our work as a subcommittee to request proclamations across the state to draw some attention to you on this day. Yes, as somebody who, you know, works more in the mediation and the arbitration context, I I don't know as much about ombuds work as probably I should, uh, but I know it spans a lot of different industries in both the public and the private sector. Um, I was first um, learned about it in the context of a lot of newspapers, uh, which traditionally have an ombuds person Uh uh, to go to with um, ethical issues and disputes and whatnot. I know a lot of universities also employ ombudsmen in in various capacities. All right. Specifically, uh, speaking about what you do, let's start with the basics. What is a long-term care ombudsman? Yeah, I am biased, but I think we are the best type of ombuds. <laughs> <laughs> long-term care ombudsmen are the simplest definition is we are advocates for residents of long-term care facilities. And this looks a little bit different based on how a state licenses facilities, but generally speaking, we have jurisdiction in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and then smaller group homes that serve um, older Americans. And our role is to, first and foremost, work to resolve complaints that are brought to us by residents or on behalf of residents. And our sort of benchmark for success is the resident satisfaction. Okay. And just, you mentioned helping out um, older Americans with uh, long-term care issues. It's important to note that obviously uh, Americans of of all ages could end up in a long-term care facility or need uh, uh, assisted living help. But your office specifically is focuses on older Americans. That is such a great question, and yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. We actually serve 
anyone that resides in a long-term care setting. But when you're thinking about how states license facilities and what they call a long-term care facility, sometimes that really boils down to predominantly who a facility serves. And that's how we uh, get our jurisdiction in different states. Very good. But we serve anybody that resides in a long-term care facility. Fantastic. Okay. What does a day in the life of a state ombudsman look like? And then how about a local ombudsman and just maybe break out what the difference is between the two? Yeah. Jurisdictionally. I just love, <laughs> yeah. I love this question. Every day is a little bit or sometimes a lot <laughs> different for me. And that's what I enjoy so much about being a state ombudsman. And I think if you talked with my colleagues across the country, they'd probably say the same thing. So in my role, I am I directly oversee and lead a team of ombudsmen across the state of Tennessee. So I'll point this out too. State ombudsman programs operate under different models. In some states, the state ombudsman um, has the personnel management function. That means they oversee the, the salaries and the hiring and the firing and these sorts of things for their team. In other states like Tennessee, we operate through a decentralized model. And that means that I subcontract out for services. So the personnel management piece is taken on by community-based organization where my program is housed. But ultimately, all ombudsman activities are my purview. So everything that happens in the state of Tennessee done by a long-term care ombudsman that I have trained and certified falls to me to oversee. And to give you an idea, like last year, we had over 4,500 complaints that my team responded to. Yeah. Are the 19 district ombudsmen that are on your staff, is it breaking down by county or is the district not necessarily a county? Yeah. So we have nine district ombudsman programs in Tennessee with um, each of those has the smallest has four counties. It's the sort of the Memphis district in Western Tennessee. And then some of our larger uh, districts, geographically speaking, have 13 plus counties. Um, So We base the number of ombudsmen provided um, in each county on the number of facilities in that area, um, the number of beds that they provide services in. Um, We're fortunate that we get support at the local level as well. If we've got, you know, in a particular district, more funding coming in, we can hire more staff in that area. So there is community buy in each of our districts. And obviously, Tennessee is a unique state in the sense that you have both urban areas in Tennessee as well as rural areas. So folks have to, Mm -hmm. I guess some of your folks are are addressing a very large geographic territory when you think about it. They absolutely are. I have ombudsmen that remind me when I ask them, can you go out and see this resident today? And it's, that'll take an hour and a half to get up the mountain. (laughs) It's going to be a while until I get there, but but yes, I can. And there are other, you asked about the role of the state ombudsman. So I lead the team. I'm responsible for all of the program management, contract language, policies and procedures, reviewing program expenditures, helping to establish budgets, all of our training requirements, managing our documentation system, scrubbing data, doing all of our reporting. So all of those things fall under my purview. I also work to establish really excellent relationships at the state level that help us do the work that we do with Adult Protective Services, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and our state survey agency and members of the legislature. Hmm. Um, and then the, I would say the one of the, the tasks that the state ombudsman really is primarily responsible for, and this is different from some other ombuds functions, is the legislative advocacy. We are directed in the Older Americans Act to really learn from uh, our representatives, from our district ombudsman, in terms of what they're hearing from residents and from facility staff and family members and the broader community about what's going and what isn't. And we elevate the concerns that are brought to us to stakeholders, to legislators. We comment on laws, regulations, policies that impact long-term care residents. And we are directed to, regardless of um, if it's controversial or what others in the state think, to really highlight the needs of long-term care residents to make sure that their voices are heard when decisions are made about their care. Could you give uh, an example of a recent complaint or two that your program has worked to address? Yeah, sure thing. 
And I'll start by saying that in all cases, there is an underpinning of staffing issues in long-term care settings that really in the complaints that we address are if we didn't have staffing issues in a lot of these cases, we the complaints wouldn't be as egregious. And it's not only number of staff, it's um, training for staff, it's um, how staff function within a facility. So if residents and staff work together every day, we call that consistent assignment of staff. And that works better, as you can imagine, than if a resident and a staff person see each other twice a week because the staff is reassigned to different halls, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't get the opportunity to really learn um, what residents need and how they prefer to receive services. So we're always working to address issues with staffing. We also recently um, have been working with a district ombudsman who um, is talking to a couple of residents who received involuntary discharge notices when a facility tells a resident that, hey, you've got to go for a variety of reasons, they have to send those notices to the Office of the State Ombudsman. And this is across the country. And State Ombudsman and their representatives then reach out and talk with residents about what happened if they want to leave. And if not, we work to advocate for those residents um, and make sure that the facility is doing all that it can to put a safe discharge plan in place, if that is the ultimate action that's going to happen. In these recent cases, this facility was actually trying to discharge several residents to a homeless shelter. Mm. After looking at it, it didn't seem safe, it didn't seem appropriate, and the residents didn't want to go there. And we learned through investigation that the facility hadn't done its due diligence to really learn about those residents on assessment, to build out a care plan that met their needs, and to start discharge planning on day one with them so that they ultimately had some options about where they might go next that weren't homeless shelters. Yeah. Um, we, we also, in terms of you know recent cases, we are always working to um, uphold resident dignity and make sure that facility staff understand residents' rights to self-determination. Society thinks that when residents walk through a nursing home door, that somehow they lose their rights, that they can't make decisions about their care, that their preferences maybe don't need to be honored in the same way that they do in other settings. And ombudsmen really are the loudest voices in the room saying, hold on a minute, Let's hear what this resident prefers and honor his preferences as we move forward. The, uh, the staffing shortages that you mentioned, obviously not a, a problem unique to Tennessee. We have the same issues where I live out here in California. We're not enough staff at some of these long-term care facilities. I think a lot of it has been post-COVID. A lot of people maybe left the profession of, of, of caring for folks uh, and mm -hmm. didn't go back. Can you speak to uh, the impact that possibly COVID had on the long-term care facility in your part of the country and how that's impacted things? Yeah, it's really hard to fully grasp how challenging the pandemic was for long-term care residents, their loved ones, family members, mm. staff, and everybody that serves folks in long-term care facilities. It really just was a very challenging couple of years. And you're right that the profession did see a significant loss of really dedicated direct care workers um, from the field because of a lot of reasons, but in large part, the trauma of going through that. We also know that in most cases, that is a difficult job and folks are not paid well enough. They We hear all the time that I hated to leave this position. I love working with my residents, but I can make more working for kind of the big bucks chain store down the road or the fast food restaurant across the street. And it's an easier job. The benefits are better. So it's better for me and my family. So those are things that we hear that as state ombudsmen, as, as folks that care about long-term care issues have been escalating um, for many years. And there has been an awful lot that's been done in the last few years as a result of what we've seen during the pandemic and the fallout to try to fix that system. Yeah, I think we've seen here, in, at least in California, uh, the states tried to pass 
a minimum wage for healthcare workers yeah. uh, to try to stem the loss, right, of, of folks dropping out of the profession and going into other professions. But it's to be determined how effective that's really been in, in, in stemming the loss. What's something that makes the long-term care ombudsman program unique uh, that you think might be of interest to our listeners? What's something special about it? So I think what makes us most special is, especially when you're talking about um, the ombuds profession broadly, is that we are resident advocates. For a lot of at the heart of what they do is this unbiased quality, right? They're there to negotiate. I like to say that long-term care ombudsmen are objective in our investigations, but we absolutely are resident advocates in resolution. And I'm 100% stealing that from a great mentor of mine. <laughs> we facility staff know this, that we are there to listen to what residents are telling us. And we do have strong negotiation skills uh, when we're working with providers and others. But ultimately, our goal is to work with that resident and staff and others to meet that resident's needs. And I think I, I told you earlier that really our benchmark for success is how satisfied the resident is with the services that we've provided. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Obviously, whether you're an ombudsman or a mediator or you're an arbitrator, independence and neutrality are critical. That's why they're all called neutrals because they're supposed to be neutral. So I was just looking through my notes here. The Older Americans Act emphasizes the importance of that independence. First, what is the Older Americans Act? And can you talk about what it means for your program and why it's so important um, for your clients? Yeah. So the Older Americans Act is the federal legislation that enables the long-term care ombudsman program. So Congress passed the OAA back in 1965, and there have been many reauthorizations of that federal law since. It was passed to really respond to a growing need and demand for services for Older Americans Act that time. When you think of the Older Americans Act, think of things like home delivered meals and caregiver programs, respite for caregivers, health promotion programs, senior centers. So the Older Americans Act really establishes and supports state units on aging, the state hub for aging services in every state as well as a broad aging network, this um, compendium of providers that serve older adults across the country and folks with disabilities, including one of the programs built into that act is the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. And it does indeed highlight the importance of the independence of the Office of the State Ombudsman. And this really is a critical underpinning of the work that we do. Residents need to be able to trust that their long-term care ombudsman is working for their interests and not impaired by other interests. And um, when you read the act, it, it calls out that long-term care ombudsman programs should be separate and distinctly identifiable, regardless of where they're housed. And we also screen ombudsman staff and volunteers for conflicts of interest very carefully before we certify new ombudsmen and then ongoing. We are always reminding ombudsmen that anytime, you know, there may be a, a conflict that could impede their ability to provide services, we're, we're paying attention to that and working to resolve it. So there's a lot of ways that we think about independence of the office and, and how critical that is, making sure that ombudsmen are providing conflict-free services. Just going through my notes here in our, our pre-call discussion, um, this was something that I was concerned about here. It, it says here that uh, retaliation uh, is mm. a real concern for your office. Um, and is that something other ombuds can relate to? And before we get to that, just when we talk about retaliation, uh, we're, we're primarily talking about uh, uh, long-term care res residents or their loved ones um, facing retaliation for reaching out to an ombuds or filing a complaint or something like that. Um, as opposed to, our, is it also retaliation against ombuds folks themselves? Mm, good question. Yeah. So this is definitely something that is a concern for long-term care ombudsmen and those that we serve. And I would bet that this is something that other ombuds also face. I think there's this, nobody wants to be a complainer or perceived as a complainer, right? There's this sort of negative connotation um, to that. Yeah. And certainly long-term care residents, they're in long-term care settings because maybe they've had an accident or a, an injury, some illness, 
and they require care, right? They are really, um, in some instances, dependent on the care staff there for things that many of us take for granted every day, independently bathing, um, getting in and out of bed, being assisted with waking up in the morning and maybe taking your AM medications. In some cases, eating breakfast, eating your meals, you might require some assistance with. If you think about putting yourself in the shoes of a resident who maybe is experiencing some of those challenges um, at the moment, and you have concerns about how you're receiving your care, but you're reliant on the staff to provide it, you're in a tough position there. You don't want staff to feel like you're ungrateful or you don't want staff to then maybe provide worse care to you or not want to work with you for fear that you're going to ask for help. And I should say that retaliation is illegal, right? right. So we need to make sure that folks remember that it should not be happening. And I'll also note that it's hard to prove, but I can't tell you the number of times a resident has reached out to us and then has received an involuntary discharge notice um, or staff are telling them, we know you called the ombudsman. Why don't you just come to us for those issues? So these things do pop up. And, and along those lines, who's typically the one reaching out to, to the ombuds office? Would it be necessarily the resident mm -hmm. themselves or the family of the resident? Because I can imagine a lot of these residents either or physically or they might have dementia or other issues that would prevent them from actually filing the complaint, being yeah, conscious of it. Right. All of the above. Residents reach out to us, their family members, other loved ones, folks that, that know them well, reach out. We'll have facility staff that call us sometimes anonymously um, and share that they're concerned about how a resident's being treated. Um, so anyone can reach out to our office and share their concerns and we will look into those. You're right, though, that some residents might not be receiving great care or they might fear that if they reach out to us, they'll be retaliated against and don't know how to reach out in a way that's safe. Um, ombudsman programs across the country have posters hung up in long-term care settings. So folks- And that's required by law, right? To have these yeah. things posted, right? It is okay. It is in nursing homes. So federal regulations require that's posted. It, it varies by state. Um, for other long-term care settings, because those generally don't have that federal sort of oversight. But in nursing homes, yes, absolutely. And the other thing that's a, a really critical role for an ombudsman is going out and making regular visits. So to, to the best of our ability, we really try to get out to every long-term care facility at least quarterly. Mm -hmm. That sort of is the gold standard um, right now for, for regular presence or advocacy visits to facilities so that residents know that they can reach us. There are a lot of residents that maybe are just in a facility for skilled care, so they're just there for a few weeks. And unfortunately, we there's a, a lot going on right now around budget advocacy for the program, but we really do have too few staff in Tennessee and across the country to be able to provide Ombudsman services to everyone that needs them in these settings, but that person that's just there for a month maybe won't have met their ombudsman because they're going out on a quarterly tempo. That's all that they can do. So we worry about that, and there really is a gap in service there. Volunteers help to fill those gaps when they're available, when we can recruit volunteers to go out and talk with residents about what we do. And I actually, I just heard a story from a district ombudsman recently who it was in a home that is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> We've got a lot of complaints that come out of this home. And this really wonderful man was making very regular visits to the home. And so this one particular resident saw her frequently and Made, made eyes with the ombudsman. And so the ombudsman went up to her and chatted and there weren't staff around. So she felt empowered to be able to do that day, but was whispering, right? right. And was saying, I've wanted to talk to you, but I've been worried about what staff might say. So the ombudsman gave her card and said, call me and we can have that private conversation over the phone because she really was concerned that staff would notice she was talking with the ombudsman. Yeah. Along those lines, uh, you mentioned not all long-term care is necessarily long-term care. Sometimes it's short-term care, might be a month at a time, something like that. Um, is hospice care and end-of-life care also under the same umbrella of what you um, 
uh, manage? Yeah, so so not um, generally, although I will say it depends on the state. In some states, there are standalone hospice providers that are usually licensed a different way. Uh, but many folks receive hospice services in your traditional long-term care facility. So in a nursing home or assisted living, or they receive hospice at home. So there are different ways that a person can receive that hospice care. Generally speaking, if it's a hospice, a standalone hospice unit, the ombudsman program um, wouldn't have jurisdiction in that setting, but lots of folks receive hospice care again in, in facilities where we do have jurisdiction. Now, you mentioned that uh, one of the individuals or uh, that might call in a, a, an issue to the ombuds office might be employees in the facility themselves. Yeah. Um, and uh, as far as the types of issues that they're calling in, I imagine it relates to patient safety or resident safety. But in addition to that, do they sometimes, for example, call in the labor violation? So like something, that, something that might be reported to the a wage and hour violation, for example, the Tennessee Department of Labor, that kind of stuff, they report they, that? They do, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it runs the gamut, what staff call us about. And you're right to say that most often they're calling because they're concerned about something they've seen in terms of resident care or resident needs not being met. We also increasingly are hearing from staff, they'll call and say, I am the only CNA that is working on shift right now, and I can't do it all, but leadership isn't listening to me, and I'm not sure what to do. I need help. But yes, they also will call and tell us that we haven't been paid, or our checks bounced, or there aren't enough supplies or food for residents, and, and we don't know who can help us with those things. Generally speaking, when it's an employment issue, if there isn't a direct impact on resident care, let's say you've got a disgruntled employee who maybe calls and says they were fired for a particular reason, mm -hmm. we'll help to give them resources. We'll tell them what we've heard from others in the past and how they resolve their issues. But that isn't something that an ombudsman, long-term care ombudsman opens a case for. Right. But if there's an impact on residents, then we will. And that staff person can be the complainant in our case. And then along those lines, unfortunately, Medicare and Medicaid fraud are something that's become prevalent across the country, not just in, in certain states. Do, do you ever re receive reports of those kinds of things, billing for patients that don't exist or services that were never provided? Yeah, we do. And again, these are instances where either connecting that person with the appropriate investigative entity, right. we work very closely with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Uh, they work to investigate Medicaid fraud. They've got a, a whole unit that that does nothing but this to make sure that they they have those referrals that they're being sent there appropriately. But we'll also, again, if there's a, a component of resident care, we will look into those issues. So sometimes we're not necessarily focused on the, the fraud piece. Others do that, but we're focused on what happens when residents aren't getting the care that they should be. Worthless services, residents aren't receiving the care and treatment that maybe the staff are documenting. Um, so we'll look into those things and investigate those issues and try to resolve them for those residents. Now, the BUDS committee is part or section is part of the dispute resolution section, which is made up of mediators, arbitrators, other folks that are involved in dispute resolution under the umbrella of the American Bar Association. I think there's an assumption that in dispute resolution, most of these folks that work in ADR are attorneys, which I know is not necessarily true. Speaking of the backgrounds of, of being an om ombudsman, what are the typical fields that ombuds come from? Are they coming from more the legal field, more social work? I noticed your background, for example, you, know, you have a master's degree in social work and, and yeah. things like that. What do you typically see? There's a lot of variety. And I really think that lends itself nicely to the work that we do, because regardless of where the ombudsman is housed, really a state ombudsman program is one big team. Um, having somebody who uh, is trained in law and having someone who maybe is a retired nurse and having folks that are have social work backgrounds can hone in on quality of life issues um, helps us to have a broader view and more investigative abilities than we would if it was just one of those professions. So there's a lot of variety in backgrounds of ombudsmen. 
Um, and I guess that leads into my to my next question. What would you recommend for somebody who wants to become a long term care ombudsman? And are there any training programs specifically? What's what are kind of the the training path, if you will? Yeah. I will tell you that I think being a state ombudsman is the best job in the world. There really is nothing better than feeling like you've not only helped to address an issue for an individual, but have also worked to impact an entire system that will then provide better services to thousands of long-term care residents and, and those that continue to receive that care in the future. If you are interested, please pursue it because the work is just incredible. Um, there's a lot of it. <laughs> there are definitely challenging days, uh, but at the end of the day, it just is so rewarding. In terms of training requirements, there are federal minimum training requirements to become a long-term care ombudsman. That's a 36-hour initial training that if you're really interested, you can check the Administration for Community Living's website or the National Ombudsman Resource Center's website to see what all of those components are. But um, usually comprised of getting a good handle on what long-term care looks like in a state, basics on investigative techniques, the differences in unique characteristics of residents that we serve, these sorts of things. So classroom work, lots of self-study to fully understand federal and state regulations for these provider types, um, as well as a significant amount of in-the-field training, right? Because you don't know what it means to be an ombudsman until you're out in the field talking with residents and staff and walking those halls. If you're interested, if that sounds appealing to you, I would recommend that you check out the Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care's website. That's theconsumervoice.org. If you scroll down to the bottom of that web page and click Get Help, you will see contact information for all ombudsmen across the country. Every state ombudsman's training program is a little bit different, but all of us meet those minimums. And your state ombudsman um, or her representatives will provide that training and then certify you to be a representative ombudsman. And from there, there are lots of volunteer opportunities across the country to get your feet wet and really learn what it means to do the work. Uh, yeah, I would urge you to take a look and, and join us. And for, the, and for those folks that are interested in doing more of the volunteer work as opposed to the full-time um, yeah. uh, position, did they go through a similar training protocol? or? Yeah, so the minimum is for staff and volunteers. Any certified ombudsman across the country has to go through those minimum sort of 36 hours of certification training. Yeah. Um, but again, in every state, it looks a little bit different. In some states, the state ombudsman has built in extra training requirements. And then once you're certified, every ombudsman has to have at least 18 hours of continuing education that they complete every year. And usually it's much, much more than that. So there's ongoing training. Ombudsman have to know a lot about a lot. And things are always changing, particularly as it relates to federal regulations that, you know, in the settings that we serve. So lots of opportunities for always learning, always growing. I learn something new every day, which can be really exciting. And I will say too, that we rely heavily on volunteers. And in many places, they're working right alongside their staff ombudsman to investigate complaints directly working with staff to resolve these issues. They're out making those regular presence visits to make sure that residents know who we are and how to reach us. They'll attend monthly resident council meetings in these settings and help to ensure that residents have a voice in those settings, that they feel empowered to share concerns and grievances um, with their councils. So there's a lot of wonderful work that's done by our volunteers that really without them, we, we couldn't do this job. I can definitely hear your, your passion uh, for the job through our, our conversation here. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share about the profession, about getting into the profession, yeah. about why you do what you do? I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share the fact that if you are a part of a long-term care ombudsman team, you quickly learn we are a national network of advocates that are kind and humble and brilliant and just so giving. Just being able to sing the praises of my colleagues across the country has been uh, just a really wonderful opportunity. So thanks for that. Yeah. 
All right, Teresa, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for spending some time with me. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on Resolutions. Today's episode has illuminated the powerful impact of effective dispute resolution and showcased the incredible individuals who dedicate themselves to this important work. Our mission is to explore the diverse world of dispute resolution, and we hope we've inspired you to engage with conflict and collaboration in new ways. If you're not yet a member of the ABA section of dispute resolution, we invite you to join our community of professionals making a difference. Your involvement can help us build a more harmonious society together. And if you found value in our conversations, please consider leaving us a review and a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Your feedback helps us reach more people and continue our journey towards excellence in dispute resolution. Until next time, keep solving problems, building bridges, and creating positive changes in your communities.